Welcome back, everybody. It's a new day, and I hope you have uh, cultivated loving kindness since the retreat began. And in fact, it would be nice if you had started early <laughs> before the retreat. <laughs> and uh, we're continuing our uh, opportunity for questions and answers, and this is traditionally what we do during retreats, and we do it all year round when we have guests in retreat, and we have a what's called a tea time at Birkin. And this is a good situation, <clears throat> which uh, didn't necessarily always occur in uh, in the monasteries that I were, was in, and I thought it would be a, it's a good opportunity for more or less casual uh, questions, especially about the, the talks. And um, so I invite uh, any questions around the topic that we've chosen, this loving kindness, and we will explore the full details of it and all of the strategies, tricks of the trade, and uh, anything that helps you uh, develop this, cultivate this uh, emotion of true well-being and health. So I invite uh, any questions, and we probably have some. Yes, Ajahn. Our first question is live from Rob B. in Portsmouth, England. Rob, please ask Ajahn your question. Yes, thank you. Um, and yeah, so my question is relating to obviously Meta and what I wanted to ask was what is the relationship between Meta and the seven factors of enlightenment? in terms of where it fits in. Metta and the seven factors of enlightenment. Aha. It sounds like Snow White and the seven dwarfs. Are, uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, the seven factors are entwined uh, with metta, but they are a larger uh, strat uh, structure than metta. Metta has some of the qualities of the seven factors of enlightenment, but not all of the qualities of the seven factors of enlightenment. And not everybody knows what the seven factors of, of enlightenment are, but I, and I won't go into an encyclopedic uh, discourse on that. If I want to tell the audience that if uh, at another time you want to review this seven factors of enlightenment, and they're very, very important, I have uh, done a number of very exhaustive uh, talks on this on the YouTube channel. So I've given whole retreats on the seven factors. But because we're on the loving kindness uh, topic, I want to stay fairly close to that. Loving kindness uh, fulfills a couple of things. One, it participates in uh, energy, which is the third factor of the seven factors. It participates in joy, which is the fourth factor, uh, fourth factor, and it participates in serenity, pasadi, in uh, the, six, uh, the fifth factor of the seven factors. So it's not particularly an investigation of dhamma. That's the second second factor, but it's um, it allows the mind to be uh, calm, collected. And without the hindrance of hostility and anger, and also without greed. So it leaves the mind in this kind of situation that it's very workable, um, very capable of focusing on pertinent Dhamma topics. So this uh, question could have a whole, you know, there could be an entire uh, an hour of talk on the seven factors, etc. But I, I don't want to drift too far away from from metta. But certainly metta assists the seven factors of enlightenment, and the uh, seven factors of enlightenment uh, not only assist loving kindness, but also swallows loving kindness, uh, includes loving kindness <clears throat> at times. Loving kindness is not exclusively the contents of the seven factors, 
but uh, it certainly one uh, very useful and a beneficial factor of these seven factors. So that's a little a reply in brief. As I say, I think we're, we want to set the tone for the retreat that we don't want to get too wide um, with the field of the questions. So we will stay with, uh, we'll try to center around loving kindness. Yeah. Next question. Ajahn, our next question is live from Ranga J in Homdel in the United States. Ranga, please ask Ajahn your question. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are you able to hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, stewards, for facilitating it. And thank you, Ajahn. My question is around metta as it relates to the body. So as metta arises or deepens, does it tend to bring about any sensations in the body? Is it accompanied by sukha or, or piti? Uh, if you could expand on that, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, it is. Uh, and this is the only way you're going to know that metta is present. It's not an intel it's not an idea. And it is known because it has both a emotional um, effect and it has a physical uh, affects the the physical feelings as well. So both the emotional feelings in, in English we get very confused about this because we we refer to sensations in the body as feelings. And then we also refer to what we call emotions as feelings. So I'm talking about both the, the bodily feeling and the emotional feeling. So loving kindness, one of the benefits of loving kindness is that it reduces pain in the body. And in fact, can replace that with even positive flushes of, of uh, what is called sukha. And sukha, so not everybody in our audience knows what sukha is, but sukha is a, a condition of bodily happiness. And piti, which Ranga mentioned, is a condition of emotional joy. These are two factors which rise, if you can absorb into a loving kindness, then those two factors will arise. Joy in the mind joy, uh, emotional joy, and the body is suffused with a sense of well-being. This, uh, this pervades the whole body, and uh, some of the other side effects are that, one, uh, that pain in the body uh, diminishes. And by the way, this is really very, very interesting and important as a kind of a treatment for chronic pain. Metta, if you can talk yourself into metta, if you can generate metta, and also if, if you happen to be a persuasive personality, I would even suggest that you might be able to assist others that are, have a condition of chronic pain. And there's lots of people in the world with chronic pain that's almost inaccessible to some types of medications. So if you can either recommend the practice of, of being talked into loving kindness for people who, you know, they, they have chronic pains in their necks and their spines, uh, knees and various types of things that actually loving kindness has enough potency to reduce that physical pain. And I actually know of uh, some hospitals where the pain specialists use, give a course or a class uh, or an induction in loving kindness because the potent painkillers that they use are not effective on every, on all patients. And so some of them have, just because they have gone off to meditation retreats and so forth and encountered loving kindness, they realize this is a very viable strategy for the reduction and elimination of pain. So uh, that is a, pleas a pleasurable experience. I just want to talk a little bit about three, three kinds of feelings. Pleasant, neutral, and painful or unpleasant. Now, if you have physical pain and then 
you um, take a, an aspirin, get rid of a headache and so forth, that absence of the pain, you experience that as pleasurable. It comes to you as very positive after having the negative experience of pain. Just the absence of pain can be experienced as pleasurable. If though, after a very pleasant experience, very pleasurable experience, you go down into neutral neutral uh, experience, uh, then it will be felt as kind of dull or boring. So you experience these this neutral feeling in two different ways. So loving kindness is always a positive uh, experience. It's never just neutral. But if you manage through loving kindness to relieve the sensations of pain in the body then you, you, will, you will experience that as a very pleasurable experience. And, and if you don't have any physical um, pain in the body, you will still experience uh, the true quality of loving kindness as a sweeping through the body. Now, I would say that uh, it's, people describe this as in various ways. And when we use the word love, we, we get all confused with romantic love and all this kind of stuff. So, it is a matter of the heart, but it's not to be confused with a kind of a overwhelming uh, feeling of the heart. It's just a very healthy feeling of the heart. And that, 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 when I say the heart, I mean the emotions, the emotional structure. What's your, what does your head feel like when, with loving kindness? Actually, it feels cool. Your loving kindness, true loving kindness, does not participate in uh, any negative emotions. And the negative emotions often occur in the head. Uh, confusion, um, sorrow, grief, anger, you know, it flares up in the, you feel it in the forehead. You can see people's face flush with heat when they're in anger, etc. So the experience of loving kindness feels, and I've, I have this little phrase, it feels like you have a cool head and a warm heart. So think of uh, getting into an, on a cool evening, getting into bed with a nice down duvet uh, and pulling it up to your neck, but leaving the window open a crack for fresh air so that your head is cool and you have fresh air coming in, but you feel warm throughout your body. And as notice that in Ordinary English, we speak of the warmth of human friendship, the, a warm friendship. So, so that's, that's appropriate to, to look at that. The other thing is uh, relaxed. So metta relaxes you. It is also, you, can f you feel very secure. Now, this is, now we're going into the emotions. So you feel very secure. You don't feel threatened because there's no fear in, in loving kindness. So you can deal with people's criticisms. Uh, if you are an insecure type of personality, person with inferiority complex or any of these things, what is the cure for this? I must say, probably not psychotherapy. It's just pure loving kindness. You don't have to go into the reasons why you feel this way why it started in uh, what your family life and all this. If you can get to this condition of loving kindness, you will simply feel secure. And you won't feel threatened um, or mm, a sense of shyness or concern in, in the presence of others. So it, also, if you're a shy, nervous, mm, loving kindness is a very good practice. And so... You tell yourself that you are, uh, you are well, and uh, then you are not uh, threatened by uh, the the social social pressures. So this is very very good. Uh, that feels good. It feels wonderful, actually. Uh, a lot of people walk through all almost their entire life with afflictive emotions. You know, nervous, concerned, shy, self doubt. Uh, uh, self-criticism, uh, over-concern with the opinions of others, etc. 
Now, this is a grinding experience. So with metta, none of those happen. And so you're, you're, you immediately feel a relief, emotional relief. So that's the, what ha the heart, the emotion of, of even just neutral emotion after painful emotion is also experienced as very pleasurable. So your emotional quality is very pleasurable. The body is swept with a similar kind of dampening of physical uh, pain. And in the case where you don't have pain, it's swept with a physical sense of, of, uh, of, of well-being. This can be very extreme, actually. It can, you can actually have tears. Um, you can actually have kind of uplifting feelings. Uh, if you want to know the secret of levitation, wink, wink, it is uh, that it, physicists are right. There is no such thing. But <laughs> there is... In the human realm, in the actual experience of life, how your perception of the weight and density of your body is purely held in the mind. Your body is in your mind. It's not the opposite. Your mind's not in your body. Your body is in your mind. When your mind changes, and when I say your mind, I mean your heart and the thinking processes and everything, the emotions, that transforms your entire perception of your body. It's very, very powerful. And so look to your mind uh, first, and your body will be swept up in, in this. So those are a few of the... Uh, so. Uh, think of a nice uh, down comforter, but your head is uh, not covered with it. Second, uh, getting into a nice w hot tub. That's also keep your head above the water. The body's in the water. The head's out in the, in the nice cool air. So these are, these are the balance with loving kindness. It's a full, warm, relaxed, pain-free experience with lucidity of head of the mind, and you feel that in your head. Lucid, spacious, airy, un, uh, unconcerned uh, with, with uh, danger. You you're feel safe as well. Okay, so that's some of the descriptions, and I will get into this in, in future talks. I will get into the, the details of this because that's very important to understand. This is a whole body experience, a whole emotional experience as well. So thank you for that question, Ranga. Our next live question is coming from Georg B. in Lethbridge, Canada. Yes, thank you, Pierre Dassi. Hello, the Ajahn. Uh, in the first verses of the Metta Sutta that you chanted so beautifully at the beginning of the meditation, uh, we heard that one should develop good, good ethical conduct, for example, being straightforward and gentle in speech. Is it right to say that the development of good ethics, sila, is the foundation for generating loving kindness and the condition for remaining on board the canoe called metta? Very good question, Georg, and I uh, appreciate your, your appreciation of my chanting. I think we still need some uh, pitch control on that chanting there. We, we, uh, you can you can work on that for me. <laughs> Georg is a musician, so. <laughs> but considering it's it's a cappella solo in the middle of a of a of a sala, uh, it's close enough. <laughs> anyway, we will move on to the uh, to the question. Ethics as a framework for loving kindness, yes, indeed. One of the it's just a a way of helping you. The Buddha makes you understand you cannot separate the way you behave in life, the way you speak and the way you act in life from your emotional life. You cannot possibly hope to walk around full of loving kindness and live uh, a life that is threatening to other people, that uh, threatening to their possessions, threatening to their well-being, uh, full of harsh speech or uh, deceptive speech, how can you possibly um, hope to have the emotional well-being of loving-kindness 
which is both towards yourself and towards the other beings in the world, and at the same time live a, a, a non-ethical life, a non-moral life. So the Buddha is saying, you can think of it in, in one of two ways. You can start with ethics. So, by the way, I think this is the way uh, uh, we teach piano as well. Uh, you, uh, you don't start with music, usually with the piano. You start with notes. And notes are the ethics of uh, our, our ethics. Uh, you, you have to play the right note at the right time. And uh, this requires certain physical positioning. But if you don't do that, you, won't play, you will not produce the music in the end. Uh, so, the, the, this is important to play the notes. But merely the notes are not the music. The music is something else which appears if the notes are uh, ordered in the right way. <clears throat> and loving kindness is the music. Ethics are the notes. And so, now some people are very, as in the music area, the, some people are very musical, but they have not learned uh, how to place their fingers on the notes and everything. This is the case where a person has a, basically a good heart. They, they have the friendliness, the goodwill, and they naturally seem to be ethical. And this is the case. If you really have loving kindness, it is the source from which all ethics are drawn. So the good heart, what is the good heart? It is the recognition of yourself in others and others in yourself you can see that how it would feel to be threatened, how it would feel to have things taken from you, how, to, how it feels to be deceived. And since you do not want that, then you also see that others do not want that. So that feeling, that, that's a breakthrough in human psychology. Not everybody can do this. And when it's completely absent, we call that person, when it's completely absent, it's a sociopath or a psychopath. And when it's fully present, we call them a saint, perhaps, or a, a great person. There, you cannot be a great... There are no such things as great people who do not have the capacity to recognize themselves in others and to recognize others in themselves. So this, is, this stirs the heart and you put down your weapons. And when you do this, you are rewarded. This is, uh, you are kissed on the forehead. Uh, the moment you do this, your system, your internal system is flooded um, with feelings that confirm that you are, you have uh, found your way into a special dimension of human existence. The doors open and you walk through and um, there's a kind of indisputable rightness about the feeling. You, you feel that this, that there's no questioning of this. <clears throat> you know, when I, when I was, uh, well, I still read philosophy and so forth, you know, again, and philosophers endlessly argue about the nature of what is morality, what is what are ethics, what are virtue, and so forth. If, they're, if the answer is disconnected from this primary feeling of, of friendliness, goodwill, then it makes no sense. They cannot develop an, a reason for behaving in, a, in an ethical way. But once you have this feeling, then you realize the, root, uh, the roots of all ethics and all morality. All speech and action follow from this, this feeling. So <clears throat> in uh, philosophies and religions that, that do not ha have any cause for behaving yourself other than it's God's commandments or something like that, then uh, they, they haven't got the right cause for it. So the Buddha doesn't look for any other cause than it, it registers in your... Uh, throughout your body and mind as 
as having encountered the divine, and that changes everything you say and do. But at first, we just take you through the motions be, until you feel that experience. We tell you, here's how this will help you along the way. Don't do, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit sexual misconduct, don't lie, stay away from the intoxicants, and then you have a, a good beginning to possibly experience this emotion. So that's this very important relationship. And see, you see how extensive the inquiry, uh, the, the examination of this is in the Metta Sutta. And I'll be talking tonight, I believe I will start talking about these qualities this very night um, uh, with the Metta Sutta. And you will see that I, I stay on it for quite some time because these preliminary qualities are very important to the production of this uh, loving kindness. So thank you, Georg, Georg for the uh, question. Our next question is from Mudita H. in Kamloops, Canada. I know I'm going on this cruise in my canoe, but is it okay if I wanted to be in a yacht as well or just concentrate on my canoe? Yes, uh, dear. Um, Mudita, uh, the canoe simile is is that sometimes you're by yourself. And by the way, a lot of monks and nuns spend a good deal of their lives by themselves. So they have given up the intimacies of family life and married life and all this. And uh, I think ordinary people think, well, that would be very lonely, wouldn't it? But then the Buddha says, but some of these uh, people who live alone uh, dwell in loving kindness not just for a day, but day and night, not just for a week, not just for a month, but year after year, the whole life immersed in that. So this, uh, if you are in a canoe situation where you're basically on your own, there is no excuse for to feel lonely or um, not connected. You, the connection to other beings is through your heart and through your mind. It is not how close you are physically to somebody, you, not, not whether you're three feet away or 30 feet away or whether you can see them or hear them, it's uh, developed in your mind. And quite often the best place to develop loving kindness is alone. <laughs> now we will go back to the music situation where most musicians have to go to a practice room all alone and that's where you practice. For hours and hours, you don't walk out onto stage. Sometimes if you're not a musician, you think, ever you just get up on stage and start playing. No, no. Especially if you're um, a classical musician or something, then you, you, most of your life is alone in a practice room. Making the music, and the music has to be made very beautifully. And once you have the skills, then you can play in public. So it's actually easier to develop loving kindness alone. <laughs> undisturbed by the realities of people. <clears throat> I mean, once you immerse with people, the challenge of maintaining loving kindness is increased. If, you, if you're amongst great people who have great capacities for loving kindness, then it's easy. But not, a lot of people are not skillful like that. <clears throat> so, there's two types of uh, uh, vehicles for it. One is the, the canoe vehicle where you're paddling alone. It's a beautiful vehicle. And the other one is where you're on the cruise ship. You're on the yacht with other people. And that's also a beautiful experience if you have the loving kindness. And uh, it's up to you. You can be around uh, very loving people. And if you don't have loving kindness, it will be a, not a, you will not have a good time. You will not have a good, ex good experience. But if you have loving kindness, you can be around even difficult people, difficult animals as well. Um, there are these beautiful people who, you know, they go to the pound and uh, bring home a stray dog or a, an abandoned dog. And that dog is maybe has been abused and not, not well behaved and so forth. And then they, but they, they have great goodwill to that dog, and then uh, slowly over time the dog 
understands. And sometimes dogs and cats and so forth, they understand even better than human. They know when somebody is not going to uh, hurt them. So this is, this is the case. So we live, uh, everybody has a different yacht that they're on. Sometimes it's a big family yacht. Sometimes it's a, it's even bigger than that, a national yacht, a sangha yacht, a monastery yacht. And sometimes you live alone in a cabin, you live alone in an apartment, you live alone in a house. That's also absolutely, you have access to loving kindness in all situations. There is no situation where you don't. And so you can go freely also from that isolation if you develop loving kindness into the larger community and that's your job is to is to develop the skills and carry the skills in so i will be talking in, in some of these talks about you know as well maybe not during the pandemic but uh, taking a, a loving kindness tour through walmart particularly go through walmart through the bleak rainy dark parking lot into the sterile environment and and embracing all beings in there including the greeter with loving kindness everybody in walmart with loving kindness don't hug them please <laughs> you're liable to get the cops called on you but you you have a this is your interior state now you have such a rich possibilities now you can go everywhere any place with a heart full of loving kindness and you can enjoy this and it's playful as well you can practice and play at this so this is a little bit about the two vehicles the canoe and the yacht our next question is a combined question there were several anonymous questions that were on a similar theme so here is that question I noticed while listening to the first talk that my mind resisted going into a state of metta it's as if it doesn't want to experience friendliness and warmth to everyone, as there is a feeling of being vulnerable and weak in such a state. It got worse when kids came along. How can I work to become a more loving, kind, and patient person to my children and everyone I encounter? Yeah, very a touching question, a very touching question, because, you know, I... I've been a monk 32 years now, 30, 31 years, 32 years, is it? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> 32 years. And, and I'm kind of a hermit before that. So in that time, I've talked to a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of mothers. And being a mother can be a, a quite a demanding job. And uh, at a certain period of your life, suddenly it, it can have a lot of changes. Uh, you're now, you have children dependent on you, you have jobs, your time is taken up. And then sometimes your children just, they, they're messy and um, you're kind of at the end of your patience and they, they're messing up your everything. It can get, you can get depressed and so forth. And so this is why... And I have I've had this conversation so many times, and uh, sometimes uh, these mothers have unnecessarily experienced depression and uh, all kinds of things, and I, I just know that it's totally unnecessary to get brought down by this. And uh, I also maybe regret not having cheered them up more and given them more of a pep talk sometimes because later on they have difficulties. So I want to make sure that you don't have difficulties and any mothers that are listening to this. You have to take it more lightly, the the behavior and demands of your children and so forth. And I want to, one of the recommendations is like, you know, when they get to be 16 or 17 or 18, and that's, that, that will go by quick, dear. It really will. <laughs> Trust me, uh, if, if, if it's been messy and hard and they haven't been uh, keeping the place nice and so forth, buy yourself new furniture at the end. Just throw the stuff out. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not about uh, being tidy and all of that at that, at that stage. 
It's not about that. It's more about being relaxed. And you're going to get a fairly long portion of your life, especially in modern times. In general, people live a lot longer and the time when there are mothers and raising their kids is a very small, much smaller portion of their, their total life. You're going to have to figure out what to do with your life after your kids are raised. You're going to, you have a huge amount of time after that to figure out and be free, etc. <clears throat> to uh, go on your, uh, your journeys and your explore all kinds of things in life. So you make sure you understand this is a very small period of time. And you will regret having taken it too seriously. So you need to not take it so seriously, much less serious. And that, and just trust that because that will lighten you up. So loving kindness has a lot in common with a sense of humor as well. It's funny. Um, and don't take it too seriously. Lighten up and make sure you stay. You, you might be incompetent as a mother, but you, you will be a jolly incompetent mother. <laughs> And it's much better. If you have a choice between competence and being jolly, take the jolly every time. <laughs> uh, it, it's, that's what's important. And that it's a very, those, those few years will go by quickly. And uh, the only regrets you'll ever have was not about whether you made a perfect cheese sandwich or whether, you, whether your kid spilled something on your coffee table or not. It's not about that. It's that uh, you, you enjoyed them. Now, you're in it, by the way. <clears throat> and whether you have regrets about that or not, you're in it. And there's a saying, when you can't get out of it, get into it. And so don't be thinking, I could be just rambling around freely right now. But I am, I'm married, I have kids, and I'm, there, I'm trapped, etc. Don't think that way. Do not think that way. Do not think, I could be free. You can't be free. <laughs> but you can be free in having kids. So get into it. Don't be thinking, I could be somewhere else. You can't be somewhere else. You're here with those kids. Now be free. How, how would you feel, when, when you feel free, what is the feeling of being free? You love being there. So if you love being there, you'll feel free. So you got you to gotta turn towards the situation and get into it. And, and you tell yourself, even though you may not even believe the words, you say, I, there's no other place I'd rather be. This is the place I want to be, I've chosen to be, I love to be, and I'm going to enjoy it to the maximum. And I'm going to enjoy these kids going through these stages to the maximum, and I don't care about the furniture. <laughs> and when I get finished with this, I'm going to buy just what I want, wear just what I want, and go anywhere I want. And that'll be your option. But you, you really need to work on this. And then your heart will be lighter, and loving kindness will come to you and kiss you on the forehead. Right on the forehead there. Yes. So, and that's for all mothers. <laughs> it, if you don't get this kind of advice and follow this kind of advice, it can be totally unnecessarily hard. And it doesn't have to be that way. You have to understand the tactics here. Next question. Our next question is from Catherine J. in Kamloops, Canada. Ajahn, in your Dhamma talk, you stated that metta is the absence of fear, anxiety, depression, frustration, etc. How do I make them be, quote, absent? I assume by elimination through practicing metta, or are there other ways to deal with these emotions to diminish their influence in our lives? Yes, there are systems... And this is the essence of right effort. And I want to <clears throat> make a little, and I'll talk about it later, and I've talked about it many times. By the way, I want to recommend also that, uh, not during this retreat necessarily, but go and watch my talks on right effort. I gave a whole, I don't know how many, a dozen talks on right effort. 
and I think that's going to be my next book, Right Effort, because it's one of the least understood factors of the path. And it, it requires that your mindfulness is harnessed for the purpose of relieving you of these negative emotional states. Mindfulness is not simply the watching or mere awareness or no, noting that you feel bad or depressed or anything. It's not that. Mindfulness is under the previous contract with right effort. And right effort is very clear in the contract. You sign your name to this contract. Those negative mental states called the five hindrances are not to be allowed to persist. They are to be eliminated as soon as possible. And now your job is to find out all the skillful ways to, to get that done. And loving kindness happens to be one of them. And it's when loving kindness is present, those other th negative things are not present. They are mutually exclusive. You do not have two things going on at once. You're not having, I'm full of loving kindness, but I also hate my neighbor. <laughs> it, it's not that way. You either have these positive emotional structures or you don't. And it's not mixed. It's just a matter of proportion. So you need to understand the techniques for the removal of these negative emotions. And they can be, this can be done by just dismissing them. It can be done by replacing them. And loving kindness would be one of the things that you replace it by. You fill yourself with this loving kindness. And there is no room for any of these other negative things. Now, how one way of doing that, if you can't generate that yourself, is the voice of another. So I'm talking to you. <laughs> right now. I'm talking to you. Listen to me and invite yourself into the, the field of loving kindness. You are, the door is open, you're welcome. And if you step into that room right now, all of those things are gone. And if you have to listen to a hundred talks on loving kindness, if, if you're, if you're having issue, you know, emotional issues during the day or in the night and so forth, Put on the headphones, listen, let the voice of another pull you into another dimension of being. Uh, be with people or other beings that pull you that way. Sometimes children can do this. Sometimes your mother can do this. Maybe your, maybe your dog can do this. And who knows, even a monk might be able to help you. <laughs> if your dog can't pull it off, maybe a monk can. Um, so you util utilize these things as replacements. And then there are other strategies as well. And uh, so go into my talks and look at for five methods for removing negative emotions. Look for that, those talks. And I, I give this talk frequently and in great detail because it's one of the worst understood structures for mind. For, it, it's in conflict with many the way people teach mindfulness often, because this is this is um, what the way the Buddha is talking about this. He's talking about the elimination of these negative emotions. He's not talking about watching these negative emotions. He's not talking about understanding these negative emotions. He's not under, not interested in the story behind the negative emotions. Psychotherapy is not invented by that <laughs> at that time, and it it is the elimination, the removal. At, by by various strategies and the replacement with these these wholesome things and this is why I'm focusing on just loving kindness for ten days. So get that thing going, and the other things will disappear. They cannot subsist with this. They they cannot coexist with loving kindness. So that is in brief. But please check out. I've given lots of talks on this. The strategies for removing those negative emotions. How to replace them with these positive structures. And that's called right effort. Our next question is from Cindy B. in Cochise, United States. Why in the eighth precept do we take a vow to refrain from lying on a high or luxurious sleeping place? 
If this was mainly relevant to a past time in history when the Buddha lived, how do we practice this precept in modern times? Oh, thank you. That's an easy question. <laughs> well, dear, uh, if you're at home, uh, just sleep in your bed. <laughs> uh, it's when you go to a monastery, um, it's inappropriate to bring a king-size bed along uh, or a fancy couch uh, because the monks and nuns have don't have those things. So it's not so important. But I think if you also want to bring simplicity into your life, a little less indulgence, and you have the, it doesn't conflict with the rest of your family structures, you might want to uh, simplify your, your, your king-size bed. I, it's, it's called a king-size bed for a reason. It used to be only kings had beds like that. Now, when everybody has more wealth, everybody wants to be a king. So they buy a, a bed the size of a soccer stadium, you know? Really not necessary. Uh, so if you want to be more monkish or nunnish, you can uh, maybe have a single bed, maybe with a modest low frame, and uh, aspire to what it symbolizes. What it symbolizes is not non-indulgence, non-luxury. Who needs indulgence and luxury? Uh, you're you're after higher things than a than a king size bed, and every time you go to that bed, you it reminds you. Say, I've chosen simplicity and humility rather than grandiosity and luxury. I've chosen that. I've made my choice. I prefer simplicity and humility rather than grandiosity and luxury. I've just made the choice. And life just got easier because it's actually quite easy to get simplicity. It's not so easy to get luxury. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, the bed is a kind of a symbol. And, but when you go to the monastery, the, the bed is, is not to be brought. <laughs> uh, you can imagine if they didn't have these precepts that people from who are from wealth and uh, raised like this might in fact bring along furnitures and stuff because monasteries are te tend to be austere. They don't have comfortable chairs and so forth. So they, this is heading it off at the pass. It's to conform with the monastic life. But if you want to be a, uh, a spiritual practitioner, a very uh, devoted spiritual practitioner out there in the world, you will incline to simplicity um, and some of the kings of the time of the Buddha also became spiritual practitioners, and they also stopped with the big, the king's bed and so forth, and they started to uh, use simple furnishings, simple clothes as well. And so you'll see this tendency in people as they change towards more uh, spiritual values, they tend to declutter minimalize and uh, just treat the the furnishings of their house as, as the background just to provide shelter from and uh, they start stop being obsessed by these kind of the glitter of things so that's kind of what uh, this talk about the the bed is all about our next question is from will k in oberlin united states Ajahn, I could really relate to those people you spoke of who find this metta feeling and then lose it, forget about it. Over this past year, I have, quote, found this feeling on multiple retreats, only to lose track of it within a couple of weeks. Do you have any advice for not forgetting the primacy of this feeling in the midst of the stress of work and daily life? Thank you. Yes, it's a regular report. I, I, have, I give retreats here. People come to the monastery for a week or 10 days, and then I have an interview with them. And the thing that they ask me quite often, as they're about to leave, they say, I feel so peaceful. How am I going to, how do I keep this peace? And I said to them, I'll, I won't tell you how to keep it, but I'll tell you how you're going to lose it. <laughs> and it won't be because of cars. It won't be because of the weather. 
It won't be even because of cats. It'll be for one reason, people. And which people? The ones close to you. you. Those who are close to you are the ones that push your buttons the most. So in the human realm, the most strongest stimulus are people, of course. A human has to be high as heightened awareness about people, their motives, etc. And which ones are, are you most connected to? Not remote strangers, not people from the past and or people from the future, but the people who are around you and who are close to you. So this is your main job is to first of all say, it's the people that are close to me and I know them well. I know their habits. I know their speech patterns. They didn't go on the loving kindness retreat. I did. <laughs> I don't expect them to understand this idea of loving kindness. Why would I do that? I don't have any expectations of them. My only expectation is of me. I'm the only one that can generate this feeling and I'm the only one that can keep it and I'm the only one that can give it away as well. They will ask me time and again to give it away, to lose my loving kindness, but I am not, I got it myself. It's my loving kindness and I ain't giving it away. So <clears throat> they can't take it away from you. And so, but you have to prepare realistically and to prepare yourself to that the demand, the most, the strongest uh, demand on uh, the maintenance of this is people who are close to you, your, your close relatives, your, your, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, your coworkers, those are the ones who have the strongest demand. And so you get that clear and straight and say, yes, that's fine. They haven't made this decision. I have. And that makes me different from who I was before. And I am comfortably uh, going to remain that way. I am going to sustain that. And I'm not going to renormalize. So people around you will actually try to trap you in who you were rather than who you are. So that expect that they're looking at the wrong person. They're looking at who you were and not who you are. Don't get frustrated with that. That's to be expected. They, they're referring to the, your history, not to who you are now. So that's your preparation for this. And that's how you sustain it. <clears throat> And it, it's best, best to start very early in the morning. The first thing in the morning is, is the time to generate the loving kindness with the full expectation that people um, will not skillfully cooperate with you. So once you get that out of the way, then the surprise, as I call it surprise meditation, take, don't be surprised when people say the wrong thing. They, they're, they're, they're crude or they're obnoxious or they're impatient. Why would that surprise you? So you say, I can't, I, I know I'm, I'm past the age of eight now, and I know the kind of things that happen in the world, the kind of things that people do to each other. I think I'm just going to stop being surprised about that. I'm going to generate loving kindness and not ask everybody to behave themselves. I know they won't, but I am nevertheless going to keep the loving kindness going. Yes. Our next question is anonymous from the United States. What is the relationship between loving kindness and the Four Noble Truths? Uh, loving kindness can do a lot for the reduction of suffering. So there's two, two uh, side effects which are the explicit suffering. That is greed and hatred. So when the Buddha summarizes it, greed, hatred, and delusion are the problem. What's the solution to greed, hatred, and delusion? The solution to greed is generosity. The solution to hatred is loving kindness. The solution to, to uh, delusion is wisdom and clarity. So if you have loving kindness, actually, you will naturally be generous and you will not have hate. So basically, you're, the pain is gone. And the only thing left to do is eliminate the, the delusion. And the delusion centers around the nature of the self and so forth. 
But loving kindness is one of the best ways to mm, transform the self, to recognize the self in others, to, uh, to weaken the sense of uh, ego and uh, these kind of things. So it's, it's naturally proceeding along the path. Insight, though, <clears throat> is not just doesn't occur naturally from loving kindness. You still need the final information about the the fantasy of self, the essence that the self is is not a thing. There is no thing called self, and so loving kindness will help you move towards that and will weaken your preconceptions about that. Uh, and then w it'll be make make it very easy for insight to arise. Uh, so it will eliminate a lot of the impediments to insight. But a lot of the, the coarse and uh, symptomatic suffering that occurs in life can be eliminated by just loving kindness. And this is the Buddha is very encouraging towards this. So there is a connection between loving kindness and the Four Noble Truths. Ajahn, our final question today is again from Anonymous from Finland. Bathing in goodwill sounds wonderful, but it also sounds a little dangerous. Is there too much goodwill which would put one at risk of, for example, being scammed? Yeah, this is a question that I'm asked a lot, and it's a very, very good question, very important to understand. Loving kindness does not make you a foot mat. You, you are not a... Vul loving kindness does not make you uh, weak or vulnerable. It makes you the opposite because loving kindness is also about yourself. And if you, ha if as a mother protects her child, now her mother is, if somebody is harassing her child, she becomes a lion, right? And <clears throat> people think, oh, if I have loving kindness, I ignore my needs. I, I'm very easy with everybody. They can take advantage, but I, I don't say anything back because that would make me harsh or anything. No, 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 no. Loving kindness does not tolerate injustice. It does not tolerate injustice towards you. It does not tolerate dishonesty towards you. It does not let anybody manipulate you. It doesn't do any of those things because that wouldn't be loving kindness, would it? That's not very kind to yourself. You wouldn't want do that to anybody else. You would object for anybody else to do that to anybody else, especially somebody you cared about. So you will also object. Nobody scams you. When you have loving kindness, that would you would be neglectful of yourself, and that wouldn't you'd be missing loving kindness. Nobody manipulates you. Nobody cheats you. Nobody gets away with anything because loving kindness. So that you must understand the nature of loving kindness is very strong, very clear, very protective, doesn't let any manipulation happen. That's not the nature of loving kindness. That's confusion. That's mere delusion. Loving kindness is very clear. It doesn't let bad things happen to you. Yeah. So that's a very, very, very important. <clears throat> 